it is February 18th, 2021. And this is our uh, school regular school committee meeting. And I start by reading our vision statement. The Ashland Public Schools cultivates the academic and social emotional growth of each student through a supportive, collaborative, innovative, and challenging environment. Students will develop into self-motivated, resilient, lifelong learners who embrace their role as responsible contributors to a global community. This meeting is being recorded by WACA Cable TV, but it, it is not live. Is that the correct way to explain what's going on here? <laughs> In our order business this evening, our call to order, our opening procedures, our agenda review and adoption. We have hashtag presentation, Diana Davis, public co comment, items of interest to the public, administrative items include the superintendent's update, COVID-19, athletics, fall sports, two vote, assistant superintendent update, warrant approval, Mrs. Bates, and approval of uh, three sets of minutes, January 13th, 2021, January 15th, 2021, January 21, 2021, acceptance of gifts and donations if there are any, committee reports of activities, member updates and action items, and then we will adjourn. So I will take the roll call and then just make sure that uh, you all are okay. Uh, Aaron will be a few minutes late. Um, so I will start with Mark. Uh, here and yes. Kathy. Here and yes. Paul. Here and yes. And uh, we'll see Aaron shortly. Um, we have ASHPAC first, but I think I'm going to uh, ask you guys if it's okay if we move the public comment ahead of that, where it usually is, um, before we go into that presentation, just in case there is anybody here that wants to give public comment. Is everybody okay with that? Do I have consensus? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm fine with it. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there anybody here from the public that would like to offer us comment this evening? This is our public comment period, and you have up to three minutes to let us know what you want us to know. Okay, then seeing none, um, and I'm not sure if I see Diana yet. Is Diana here? Christine's going to do it tonight. Christine. Hi, Christine. Hi, Laurie. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. I just want to first say thank you to school committee for allowing us to do our presentation. Um, as many of you know, we usually do it in the fall at our annual meet the administrators night, but unfortunately, we weren't able to have that. So We've been trying to think of a creative way to present the awards because, you know, of course, we really like celebrating our phenomenal staff members. So we appreciate you guys letting us do it um, now here. Um, I just want to start off by saying that um, for anyone who doesn't know what ASHPAC is, we are the CPAC for Ashland. Um, Every town and city in the state is required to have a CPAC and um, two of the functions of the CPAC are one to um, advise and support our school committee and our superintendent um, and the other is to put on a basic rights workshop every year. So our basic rights workshop will obviously be virtual this year um, on March 15th and uh, there'll be information coming out to um, our families about that. Um, I just want to say that, you know, obviously this year has been a little bit crazy for everybody, um, but we really want to thank, um, you know, everybody that has stepped up to make this year as successful as it possibly can, um, especially for our unique learners. I think that, um, you know, Superintendent Adams, Assistant Superintendent Kyra, our building principals, Kelly, Dave, um, Pete, Sarah, and Claudia. Last but not least, Claudia. Um, but I just, and all your assistants, the support staff, um, the IT department, one of the things that ASHPAC has really been able to work on this year is getting our website set up. So it's now under the Ashland Public Schools. I think it's under the com uh, community tab. And um, we really thank Ann Canton and the rest of the IT department for helping us get that off the ground. Um, I think you can imagine one of the things ASHPAC does is work very closely with Mrs. Silva in her office and we're always so grateful 
for the collaboration we have with Kathy and Colleen Brewer and Linda Lee. They're all fabulous. Everything they do to support not only Ashpack, but our families, our students, and our staff. So thank you to all of you. Um, I think obviously where we were a year ago and where we are now are thankfully two totally different places. Um, still not out of the woods, but we're slowly, it seems like moving our way out. Um, but, you know, we're always really appreciative of that collaboration we have, um, you know, to our educators, our teachers, our paraprofessionals, um, Jen Cutler and her staff who are supporting our social emotional needs um, of our students, to uh, Mr. Marks and the athletic department who have been able to successfully get two seasons of sports under your belt. Um, you know, I think that's been so important for our students and, you know, our facilities people, the custodians, Audrey LaCroix and Ed Berman, who are like the superstars of all of this. Um, we really appreciate the efforts of everybody. And I think most of all, we often forget our families who are standing on their heads, trying to be educators. And, you know, our families are really doing a phenomenal job. Um, and of course, our students who, you know, are just having to navigate through these very challenging times and they're rising <laughs> occasion. They are just really so resilient. And we know none of this is ideal, but we are so appreciative of everything that everyone's doing. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, I think that moving on to our presentation, I see that we have some of our nominees are here. Thank you for joining us during vacation week. We know that this is your time to regroup and be with your families, but we really appreciate that you're taking the time to be here and be acknowledged because your efforts have just been tremendous. Um, some of you were acknowledged specifically for your efforts from March to the end of the year for what you were able to accomplish during that remote period. Um, so thank you to all of you. Um, I think this is, and Diana, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is our seventh presentation of these awards. And how they started was another CPAC. Um, you know, every good idea comes from borrowing it from someone else. So another local CPAC started giving awards out to community members and we kind of tweaked it a little bit. We wanted it to be specifically for staff. Um, I think what we've been able to see over the years, which has been really nice, is that a lot of times it's not just special education staff who's nominated. It's um, crossed over to general educators. And I think we all know that, you know, whether you're a general educator or a special educator, you know, you will have special education students who have very unique needs sometimes. And for you to be acknowledged um, for that, I think is really pretty incredible. We um, usually send out the request for nominations at the end of every year. And then we present, like I said, the following fall. Um, so we will be sending those out and I really encourage families if there has been someone who has made a difference for your student and your family, please, it's so important to acknowledge these people, especially right now. Um, so we will be sending that out. Usually it goes out the end of May, beginning of June. Um, and the only thing that we really do ask is that people aren't nominated back to back years. Um, just so that we can spread the love and acknowledge everybody. Um, so I just really want to say thank you so much to everybody for being here. Um, I'm going to just read the nominees names um, by building. And, um, you know, again, we congratulate you all and appreciate all of you who are here. Um, I'll start with the Warren School at the Warren. Jane Guiney, who's one of our speech and language pathologists was nominated and also Erica Zipsy. Erica is one of our special education inclusion teachers. Um, at the Mendez School, um, Joseph Chiamenti, our school psychologist, Joe has actually moved over to the high school, so we're glad he's still with us, but he is in a different building now. Um, Janet Gamachi. Janet is a therapy dog handler. She bring she was bringing her wonderful dog Lydia um, into a couple of the classrooms, and she just is amazing. She's also a bus driver in the district, so thank you to Janet. 
Um, Monica Moriarty. Monica is one of our educational support personnel. Um, Nicole Natali. Nicole is a third grade teacher. And Christian Robinson, who is a special education teaching assistant. At the middle school, Amy Chickering. Amy is a special education teaching assistant. Um, Michelle Stanislazic. Michelle is our sixth grade special education teacher. Um, Keith Truesdale. Keith is our seventh grade special education teacher. And Ashley Zangi. And Ashley is our school psychologist. At the high school, um, Patty Daly was nominated. She's a social studies teacher. Sarah Finn. Sarah is a special education teacher and Regina Jardin, and Regina is one of our English language arts teachers. So congratulations to all of you. Um, we really appreciate, like I said, your efforts. You're tremendous. Please keep doing what you're doing. Keep swimming. We're getting through this, all of us together. And, um, you know, Ashpac is really appreciative of the collaboration and the efforts that everybody is putting in. So. Thank you, I will get your awards to you. And again, thank you to the school committee for allowing us to be here. And um, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Christine, and congratulations to everybody who was recognized. We really appreciate you and um, celebrate you. So keep up the excellent work. Thanks, Christine. Okay, so next up, we have the superintendent's COVID-19 update. Sure, thank you. Um, before I begin, uh, I'd like to just take a moment and send our, our best wishes and uh, to Jimmy Patriarca, who's our human resource uh, coordinator and her family who had a terrible loss last night and um, their house caught fire in Grafton and, and was destroyed and, um, you know, I just want to make sure we, we send our thoughts and prayers out to her and her family. Everyone is safe. Um, she and I have spoken a couple times and, um, you know, things are, you know, tough as you can imagine, but, but as she said, the blessing, no one was home. Um, so, so they are safe. So, um, so COVID, uh, as always, is at the forefront of our mind. Uh, here, the latest data uh, as of today, uh, this evening. And what you'll notice is, again, we have that continued um, uh, decline in cases uh, across the district and across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, and you'll notice that we're um, continually creeping. We're still in the yellow in terms of what the, the initial state metric was, um, but our positivity rate is continuing to decline. Our cases per 100,000 is continuing to decline. Uh, and these are all positive things. I know Ed and Audrey and I are certainly concerned about uh, what may happen coming off from uh, February break. Um, because if you look at, you know, the numbers after the January, December, January break, uh, in the November, uh, even the Thanksgiving um, four days, uh, we certainly had an increase in the number of positive cases um, that came about. So, uh, athletics uh, are done at this point in time, so there are no games being played, even though I presented uh, the, the data from the winter season. Uh, as you can see, even uh, across the Tri-Valley League, uh, the, the numbers are, are decreasing uh, in terms of the, the number of cases uh, in uh, the Commonwealth and, and in these communities. We currently have 76 students quarantined heading into next week. Um, of that 43 are travel. So there's uh, 33 that are not. And of that 33 though, there are 15 that actually come off on the 25th. They were part of that Warren group um, that we had, that we um, had quarantined an entire classroom. Um, but the 22nd, there, half the group comes back and the 25th, the other half comes off. But I didn't wanna take them off the list yet because they're, they're quarantined technically as we start the week, so. Um, you know, uh, Mark had asked me a question, which I'll just respond here uh, as well about the, the symptomatic 95 and the asymptomatic 63. What I want to say is that's the total we have. So we've had 158 total positive cases since the beginning of the school year um, in the district. So, um, and that, that's students. These are specifically students. 
Um, I did send a little data out earlier today and the numbers won't necessarily cross-reference perfectly because uh, in one of our spreadsheets um, and actually in this one, uh, there, are, there are two remote only learning kids that we've accounted for um, in this group uh, of the 158 versus the 156 that I would have presented earlier uh, in a, in a um, as I'm tabulating specific data by school and month. So, uh, so I see no reason why we shouldn't start next week in the hybrid model um, and continue to have dialogue uh, next week as the uh, vacation numbers unfold. So questions there. I'm just looking at the, the um, 43 that are quarantined due to travel. Are those folks that are traveling this week and are going to be quarantined next week and the week after or are those folks yeah. that traveled last week and are still just riding it out? It's a couple things, Mark. It's, it's actually all over the map, right? So there are some who, who are quarantined because they traveled um, midweek and then they've got to wait their five days for their test. Uh, it's just a matter of timing. Um, but the majority of them are related to right before vacation week and during vacation week. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Comments? Concerns? And, uh, you know, I, I know this is being taped, but I did send out a, um, just a survey uh, with regard to um, time on, you know, time in the classroom, in-person learning uh, to the community to, to get some feedback with regard to some of the CDC guideline changes, as well as uh, the transportation changes of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, and that's, will be open for, for some, you know, another week. Uh, but we've already had over 1,600 responses from parents uh, with regard to um, looking at, you know, physical distancing, mask wearing, vaccinations, things of that nature to determine uh, how we might get or potentially get uh, more students in in school for more time on learning. So, and a, a parallel survey will be going out to faculty and staff uh, this weekend. I didn't want to burden our staff with an email during the week. So that'll go out Sunday. Jim, do you expect that at our next meeting, we'll be able to discuss some of those results? Yes. Yeah, so the March 4th meeting, uh, I will have a presentation on those results. Okay. Yeah. Jim, just sort of semi-related issue. Um, how are we doing with the getting the internet service back up and you know, we're gonna be, uh, what's, what's time frame for sort of getting back to where we were before um, you know, those problems last week? So, I mean, Paul Carpenter popped into my office today and again, it's running perfectly. Um, so uh, we'll wait and see, as he said, you know, we'll wait and let's find out what happens when when kids come back and we start streaming again. But uh, again, we've invested well over $150,000 in a brand new uh, upgraded system. And, you know, he's, he and his team have been working diligently with our, um, uh, with the vendor uh, and, and trying to locate and isolate issues that, that exist. And um, there's no one more frustrated or upset that this isn't working than Paul Carpenter, believe me. And he's trying to find every way to, uh, ensure that it doesn't happen when when folks come back uh, on Monday. Yeah, I guess I understood that there was um, some repair work that had to be done in the that you're That's all painting. done. Yeah, that's all done. Okay. So that, that's what I was really looking at. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Jim? Before we move on to athletics? Okay, status quo for now. Yep. And Stephen, we'll go to you on the Fall Sports 2 update. All right, great. Let's uh, see if I can share my screen here. All right, can you guys see the presentation? Is it up? Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Well, well, thank you. I think I'll, I'll first, off, first off, start by saying thank you again. Um, 
as Mr. Adams said, we just finished the winter season. Yesterday was the final ice hockey game, um, and we had another really great season. Um, and, and a lot of thanks goes to a lot of people. Um, you know, most mostly the student athletes, the coaches, um, and and our athletic trainer Amy Mendoza. Um, everybody did their part, kept everybody healthy once we got up and running, and uh, and things went really well. So, just want to thank everybody for the support. Um, we've had two great seasons, and looking forward to a couple more. So, um, moving on the the fall two sports um, process and timeline. <laughs> I want to apologize that we're doing this so quick, um, right, as sports are supposed to start Monday. Um, as I told you last week, on the 8th, on February 8th, we got significant changes from the EEA. So that kind of, um, we kind of had to go back to the drawing board and figure some things out, um, which I'll explain later. But here's a timeline in terms of, um, you know, how things went down to get to this point. This fall two season is really going to be a, a hybrid model of what we've done the past two seasons. And the good news is, is that we've done both indoors and outdoor sports. So um, our policies and, um, you know, protocols and things aren't going to change. What's changing really is the sports that we're offering and the individual sport modifications. So um, we do, we feel confident going into this season with um, the results that we've had from both the fall and the winter seasons. So um, we're excited about that, but there are both fall, I mean, both uh, indoor and outdoor sports being offered this fall two season, which is different. So um, the individual sport modifications, um, they can, you can click these links whenever um, to see them. Again, they went through a three-step process to be approved. Um, individual sport, sport committees met, um, the sports medicine committee had to sign off of them, and ultimately the MIA board of directors had to approve the sport modifications. I can tell you that um, not all of them passed the first time. Um, some of them took uh, up to three meetings to pass the modifications, but they ultimately were all passed. So um, what Ashland plan, what we're gonna offer this fall too, we're gonna offer cheer. Um, cheer is gonna be sideline only um, as, a, as a high risk sport. They're still saying no stunting or no competitions. So we are able to have a cheer squad, which we're very excited about, um, but they will just do sideline cheering at um, football games. Um, we will have football, um, try out, everything starts Monday the 22nd. Um, we'll talk more about the schedule later, but we ended up moving football competitions or the games back a week um, in order to give the, the players more time to, you know, get used to getting the pads on, getting back in shape and, and doing some physical activity that way. Um, we're also offering indoor track. I say that with quotes because the indoor track season that typically would happen in the winter is now going to be outdoor um, and the reason it's outdoor is we don't have the facilities so we typically use Wheaton and Reggie Lewis anyway they're, they're not available so um, it track is going to be outdoors um, swim and dive um, we're able to offer that one big difference for swim is that in the past years we've typically used Keefe Tech as our pool that is still unavailable because of uh, Framingham's situation that they're in but we were able to secure um, pools for us to use um, locally that we'll be renting. Um, and lastly, we'll have volleyball. So those are the sports that we'll do this fall. What's different, again, both indoor and outdoor sports. Um, the biggest change from that um, February 8th document from the EEA was that they lifted the maximum number of, number of players per playing surface. So basically what we had been working off of the entire year of the number of 25 players on a playing surface, whether that be indoors or outdoors, they just lifted that completely and said, it's up to your facilities as long as you can socially distance and wear masks. Um, we are gonna stay with the 25 players per playing surface. Um, it's worked well for us for two seasons. Um, it's been safe. Uh, we've uh, talked it over with, uh, with Ed Naudry and we feel confident that this is what we should be doing. Um, we are not gonna be able to line the schedules up like we did in the past where we can only play one community per week. Um, I'll talk more about that when we get to the TVL stuff um, in terms of scheduling. Um, and lastly, football was approved for indoor um, sort of practices, so to speak. Originally, they were not. Um, nothing was going to be indoors. Um, ultimately, uh, the MIA met with the EEA and did allow for some indoor activities going on. Um, the TVL has approved. We're, we're just going to do walkthroughs and conditioning, no football practices inside. Um, and then the MIA Sports Medicine Committee was, uh, 
was not a fan of the EEA throwing those uh, numbers out the window. So recommended that we stay to 25 person per limit indoors. Uh, middle school sports, once again, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to offer um, for the same reasons that we did in the fall and winter that um, Amy and myself can't get down to um, the middle school to oversee that program. Um, practice sessions. So um, we are going to follow the MIA rules, which is, you know, you can go six days a week. As long as you take one day off, we're going to do our absolute best to stay away from Wednesdays again. Um, the swim team has to use um, Wednesdays because of facilities when it was available and football is going to practice on Wednesdays um, for safety reasons so they can be prepared for Friday or Saturdays. Um, football will not go indoors on Wednesdays. They will stay completely outdoors so that we can continue to clean. Um, our practice sessions will be limited to two hours. Um, coaches will keep students in pods, keep them the same as best they can the entire season. Um, and again, we'll stay to um, 25 people per playing surface. The TVL schedule um, for football and volleyball will be in the large and small divisions, which we are typically in. Um, swim and indoor track, um, it just depends on who's offering. And this is another reason why we can't play the same community each week because certain schools offered indoor track and or swim and dive during the winter season and not fall too. So everything doesn't line up perfectly across the board. Um, we tried our best again to align volleyball and football, um, but when we moved football back a week for safety issues, it, it threw things off a little bit. Um, even though we are playing in the TVL, you know, large and small and, and whoever else is offering those sports, um, once again, I'd like to have the flexibility to be able to schedule games as needed um, if teams are quarantined or if some scheduling issue comes up throughout the season. Um, April vacation is part of the fall two season. Right now, we are keeping it open for any potential makeups. Spectators, um, we try, our league tries as best we can to be as consistent as possible. Um, it, is, it is not easy because everyone's facilities are different. Um, the EEA came out with updated spectator guidelines on the 8th as well. Um, and things are just, they're not going to be consistent across um, the league. It's, you know, facility driven and district by district decisions. Um, I can say 100% um, things were a lot harder indoors than they were outdoors um, uh, for us to handle. The data from the TVL of the amount of teams that got quarantined throughout the the seasons, the indoor was way, way more than the outdoors. So um, what I'm proposing is that we stay consistent with what we've done thus far this year. And outdoor sports will allow two adult fans per player. They'll each have badges, um, have to sign into games. And in indoor sports, we will start with no spectators, but I would like to have the flexibility to revisit that um, depending on how numbers go and once the season gets up and running. Um, also would like to allow for two um, adult spectators per senior night um, so we don't have to come back and do another vote on that. Um, WACA TV is going to be live streaming the events um, and absolutely no TVL school is going to have away vis uh, spectators. It's only going to be home spectators no matter what. Um, coaching out of season rules said so we're keeping this in place as we have the entire year that's approved by the MIAA. But if you're not in season, they are not going to be um, practicing with their coaches. Transportation, um, as you, I'm sure you know, we got new transportation guidelines. Um, so we will be following exactly what our district is going to do in terms of transportation, which, which might be changing a little bit. But athletics, it's going to be no different than what's happening on the school buses during the day. Um, event day management, uh, these next couple slides are exactly the same as they have been um, the previous two seasons because, again, our protocols and our policies have not changed and they have proven to work. So a lot of this is about, you know, the daily screenings and, um, you know, how kids are going to um, have sanitizer available to them. Our athletic trainer will be available. Um, we'll have tables set up at each, you know, playing surface for them with hand sanitizer and spray and, and, um, and wipes. So, um, you know, I can go through point by point, but it's exactly the same as it's been um, the previous two seasons. Um, same thing for practice day management. Um, practice days are a little bit more challenging um, this season than even they were in the fall. 
again, because it's indoor and outdoor and moving the pieces around. So, um, you know, given the fact that it's snowing today, um, you know, we'll be moving things around in terms of practices. But again, anything that goes indoors will be 25 person maximum um, on a playing surface. Our athletic training room, we're actually going to have two this season. Um, Amy will use her office that's inside um, when she's working with volleyball and then outdoors um, up at the, the field where the uh, concession stand used to be. Um, that's what she used this fall and it worked out well. So we'll have We'll have two different training rooms. Um, we'll limit the amount of people in there, three people at most. Um, everyone needs to be wearing um, face coverings and, and Amy's in regular um, contact with Ed and Audrey and the uh, high school nursing staff in terms of anything going on. Uh, the other thing that's new is on January 27th, we got some guidance from the Department of Public Health and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, that encouraged everybody to have a return to play protocol. Um, and we will be rolling ours out beginning with this season. And basically what it is, they're you know, concerned about you know, cardiovascular issues um, that are potentially linked to COVID. So um, if there is a positive COVID case, there's steps that you have to go through in order to get back on the field or in the gym to play. Whereas before, once you were cleared, you know, throughout the amount of days, you could go back and just hop right back in. So um, big thank you to Amy Mendoza, who put the whole protocol together. And, um, and thank you to, again, Ed, Audrey, and the nursing staff, and, and Ms. St. Kerr, who, who all chipped in and, and helped look at that for us. So that is a, um, that's, that's pretty much it. Again, um, we feel very confident the fact that we've done an outdoor season and an indoor season, um, we feel better going into this. Um, weather is really the, the, the big kicker here, but we'll, we'll figure that out as we go. So happy to answer any questions. Yes, uh, and anybody who has questions, um, please feel free to ask them now. Or comments. Stephen, how many um, football players have signed up? Uh, currently, we have 81 football players. So we're going to have three teams. There will be a freshman team, a JV team, and a varsity team. And they will not, typically in football, you would see a lot of varsity and JV players swinging back and forth, playing in both. That's not happening. So they're staying, once the rosters are set, they are in that group no matter what for the entire season. Mm I have a number of questions, I guess, that I've made notes on um, that I guess I want to just clarify if I can. Um, sure. First one is that, Stephen, on the, the issue about 25, <clears throat> 25 people per playing surface, can you, um, I know we talked a little bit about this before, but you know, I'm concerned, I guess, about those days where you're doing walkthroughs with the football team or a football team and a volleyball team in the gym at the same time. And my understanding is that the way these, the sort of per playing surface would work is we basically have two playing surfaces there when the, the curtain's down, which would mean we could potentially have 50 students plus coaches in the gym at the same time. Is that, is that how you envision that happening or is that not a realistic scenario based on, you know, the activities that might be going on at the same time? that it's potentially, but our volleyball teams are not going to be 25 students. Right. So those, those are going to be smaller. Um, Coach McKay and I have talked at length in terms of what it might look like when we go indoors. And um, with the numbers of football, we would like to try and get 25 in at a time um, and spread them out and make sure that they're, you know, following all the policies and protocols, but it's not going to be um, 50 total in the entire gym because volleyball is smaller. They are um, 15 can be at most on that roster for volleyball. Well, I guess then maybe if I phrase the example a little bit differently, if you had um, the JV team and the varsity team, 25 each, would they potentially both be in the gym at the same time? So you have 50, that may be more realistic where you've got JV team on one side of the curtain and, and the varsity on the other. Yeah, it, it could, but to be honest, 99.9% .9 of the times when we can't go inside because of the weather, really only the varsity team will go into the gym. Um, the JV teams and the freshman teams will do something either on Zoom or, you know, 
when we weren't doing this, they might do a meeting or something like that. But um, again, we, we've got volleyball in there and that's their space. Um, so we can't boot them out of the gym and, and have all the football teams going right there. So, um, so I guess I'll just I'll say, you know, I don't, I'm not looking to um, add any restrictions or I'm not proposing any restrictions. I just say it's a point of concern for me. So at least to the extent that you're, you're able to manage time um, in that space, um, certainly I'd, I'd be in favor of limiting the numbers as much as possible. Um, so that was one, one point. Um, then the, um, I guess the second one is I read something in the materials that circulated that either I think in preparation for our last meeting or maybe it was in the materials that came out today. There's talking about close contacts and that you know we, we had gone through this season that just concluded by saying, you know, look, if you're playing on a basketball team as an example, everybody's going to be considered a close contact if there's one positive case. And fortunately, I don't think we had that pop up with any of our teams, but other schools did. Um, what I read, I think, is that football, that would not, that rule is not being considered, um, at least by the state MIA. Um, and I'm, I guess, be sure that that's the correct read on it and that is where things are, but also figure out whether or not the TBLs look at that differently, whether Jim and, and uh, Kelly have talked about that and take a different approach. Yeah, I mean, you're correct in the sense that the MIA didn't say that everyone would be a close contact for football. Um, once again, this came down to local decisions and within the district. Um, uh, we've had conversations and we are, for football, everybody would be a close contact. Mm -hmm. That is not going to be consistent across the board in the Tri-Valley League. But um, when I spoke with, with Ed and Audrey and Kelly, um, that, that's what we're going to do. Everyone will be a close contact for mm -hmm. football. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. That's a, that was an important consideration for me because – um, I think not only the risk to the number of kids involved, but when you've got 25 kids, you know, it's, it's a lot easier for it to come back into the building and spread to other kids. So um, that's helpful. Um, on the transportation, I, I appreciate what you said, but you're going to kind of follow what we, we set out as a district policy. Um, I assume that that means most likely you're going to be incurring additional transportation costs. I mean, suppose you can get a football team on one bus. Um, at 25, if that's what you're taking. But if you're looking at 45 on a team, um, you could have squeezed that into one bus normally, but I should, or would you be moving to two at this point? Yeah, yeah we would be going to two. And, and in terms of transportation, we, we still have fewer games across the board um, throughout the entire year. So um, we're okay there. We're gonna, we'll play it safe. And, and right now we're saying that we're gonna have two buses um, for each football game. Um, so I, I'm almost there. I got uh, one or one and a half no more questions. Um, <laughs> the last one is just on the medical clearance. I, I, you know, I'm glad that we're developing a sort of return to play protocol. Yep. Um, given that some of the cardiovascular things, I mean, the, the famous person I know is like Eduardo Rodriguez from the Red Sox, right? He got it last summer and he's still recovering. Um, are we? Is there any kind of protocol or at least the medical clearance required for a student that exam, you know, may have had COVID back in December? November, do there, does there need to be anything from a doctor saying you know, they're cleared as opposed to worry about the ones who get it tomorrow? Yes. Um, I sent out an email yesterday to um, any student that's participating in fall two sports that had um, tested positive for COVID in the previous three months and they need a doctor's note um, clearing them to participate. So um, unfortunately, we could only give them a couple days um, to get that, but um, we were finishing putting together our protocol. Um, you know, we just finished that yesterday. So I sent that. Those families have um, that information in there. Those, uh, those notes are coming in. Okay. I think those are the questions I had. Thank you for uh, all your answers. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Who else? I just had a one to piggyback on Mark, just to clarify for the close contacts for football. Would it be only the group they're practicing with, or are we going to consider the whole team a close contact? Because just from a just sheer numbers perspective, relative to the other sports that we would, we're considering, that's impacting a lot of lot more kids, right? Yeah, it would be it would be the whole team. And again, they're they're practicing and playing together. The freshmen are together, JV is together, and varsity is together. So, um, yeah, anybody that's on that team, if somebody 
If there was a positive case at Ashland, that entire team would be quarantined. If we just played Holliston, for instance, and on Friday, and we got a call on Monday that someone in Holliston tested positive, our whole team for that level would be quarantined. So yes, it's, it's potentially more students. Okay, maybe I, maybe I misunderstood uh, one of your slides that talked about uh, keeping the groups practicing together and not so like we, like we were doing in previous times where you have a smaller group of, of, uh, of students practicing together and keeping them together throughout the year. Um, so it sounds like that's not happening now and maybe I misunderstood the. No, I mean, you're just talking, there's more students in football, but there's three separate teams, right? So there's 80 total kids. There might be 30 freshmen, you know, uh, 20 for the JV and, and 30 on varsity, whatever it is. But um, yeah, those groups are going to practice together and stay together the entire time. Within that, they'll have pods where they can do drills and things like that, but they do need to practice and, and you know, do some drills all together. But when they're breaking down by skill stuff, it'll be by position and they'll have pods for that. Is that what you're getting at, Paul? Yeah, yeah. So okay. I think before they were, it was you slightly sounded more restrictive about in previous seasons where they would practice small, smaller uh, pods. But, you know, football is probably harder to do that, obviously. Uh, you, need, you need the, the, full, uh, the yeah. full crew there, so. At some point, the line needs to play with the quarterbacks, yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but Stephen, if, if, it's, if it's limited to 25 players, what will, if there's 30 on the team, what, what's coach going to do? Tell five not to come? or? No, they will stand off the playing surface. So the playing surface is defined – we can oh, find right. a, a bunch of different playing surfaces, but if you take our turf field, for instance, yeah. um, we clear the 40, between the 40 yard line, we have two surfaces on the side. Anything outside the white lines would be off the playing surface. They would be socially distant. And then when five people come off, the next five could come on. And then the coaches, on the sidelines will be making sure they're all socially distant. They better be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why do I foresee a lot of too many men on the ice uh, penalties for the football? You know? Any other questions? I don't have anything to add. I mean, you've been at this all year now. <laughs> and uh, that you are seeing what's working and, and what's not working. And a lot of it is working because we're not having a lot of incidents, right? Or even any. Um, so it sounds like all the right protocols are in place. And so I, I don't have any, any specific concerns that haven't already been raised myself. So if there are no other questions, um, somebody can make a motion for Ashland's participation um, as described in the fall sports two season. So moved. And do we have a second? I'll second. And then all in favor, Paul? Aye. Kathy? Aye. Mark? Aye. And I for me as well. So Aaron, Aaron is on. Aaron. Oh, I don't Aaron's see you. <laughs> Are you listening? Do you want to vote? Aye. Hi, Aaron. Were you here for the um, conversation and presentation? Yeah, I've been here since 610. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, That's is, okay. You're just a black anything? square, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, did you have any questions or concerns? And or are you are you prepared to vote? Yep. I for me as well. Excellent. So thank you all to the to the um, to you, Stephen, and all the coaches and everybody involved and really every single person that's on this meeting. Um, Y'all have your jobs of morphed into something that they never were before. And we understand that and appreciate all that you're doing to try to make these things happen for the kids. So thank you. Thank you guys for the support. Sure. Um, next up, uh, Mike, did you have an update for us this evening? I do not have anything to update this evening. Okay. And then Kathy, do you have any warrant approvals? 
You're on mute. There we go. Sorry, I was trying to find my my uh, my script. <laughs> Mike, you were too quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got my script. All right. Between January fourteenth, twenty twenty one, and February eighteenth, twenty twenty one, I, Kathleen Bates, authorized by my signature, payables in the amount of one million one hundred forty six thousand three hundred sixty eight dollars and seventy seven cents. This includes general fund expenses of $923,653.91, revolving expenses of $85,734.48, and grant expenses of $136,971.45, and meals tax expenses of $8.93. I also signed off on $2,174,830.13 of payroll. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Okay, next up we have three sets of minutes that Karen forwarded. So hopefully you all had a chance to look at those. Uh, we'll start with January 13th. Did anybody have any changes there? Um, I, I did not. It looked good. And what about January 15th? Uh, those looked good. I didn't have anything. Anybody? And then finally, January 21, they were all pretty uh, short, short minutes. Yep. Yeah, that looks good to me. Yep. Okay, so why don't we take a motion and we'll do them all January 13th, January 15th, and January 21, 2021. Do we mm -hmm. have a move, move that we accept them? Yes. <laughs> As is. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Mark and then yes. all in favor, Mark? Yes. Paul? Yes. Aaron? Yeah. Kathy? Yes. And yes for me. Thank you. Jim, do we have any gifts and donations? We do not. Not this evening. And um, do we have any member updates tonight? And I'm not seeing any <laughs> uh, action items are the same as they've been. And we don't have anything else for tonight. I, uh, I'll say it out loud, but hopefully everybody knows that there will be no meeting tomorrow morning. Um, we've discussed the COVID protocols tonight and the uh, everything's going to be, the expectation is that everything will stay the same when we come back from vacation. Is that correct, Jim? It's correct. That's all I was going to say. Okay. Yep. So I will take a motion to adjourn then. I just wanted to thank Ashpack yeah. again for coming tonight. Sorry. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it, was, it was a great presentation, Christine. And uh, it was nice to see all the uh, nominees and, and hear, hear absolutely. about it. Absolutely. While you guys are all still here, I mean, please know that Kathy does um, come back from your meetings and she oh. does fill us in um, pretty regularly on any of your concerns or just updates on what's been going on. And, um, you know, sometimes looking for feedback to bring back information to you all. Um, so thank you for engaging in that um, liaison relationship with Kathy. Um, I know that she really seems to enjoy, you know, being there with you. So, and, and I just want to say thank you to Kathy, too, because she comes to our monthly meetings and, you know, she also brings stuff from you guys back to us. And it's a great way for us to communicate back and forth. So I apologize, Kathy. I didn't thank you in my oh. life. No, no, no. No need to apologize. <laughs> we really appreciate having you. So thank you for what you do for us, too. Oh, great. Thanks, Christine. Yeah. Well, it was nice to have you guys tonight. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. And please feel free to update us anytime. I mean, we know this 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 past year has been um, especially challenging um, for, for the people that you serve. Um, and we appreciate that. And, and everybody is, um, I'm sure, doing their very best to try to meet this challenge. And hopefully... Um, We'll be out of the woods sooner rather than later. So thank you for all you do. So I'll motion that we adjourn. Do you have a second? Second. And then all in favor, Mark? Aye. Aaron? You 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 weren't you were not muted and now you muted yourself. You to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take that as a yes. Paul? <laughs> yes. Kathy? Yes. 
an eye for me. So good night, everybody. Have a great. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you.